Yes, yes, yes. Shalom, Chavarim, shalom. We're going to call this one right here the Ethiopian origins of ancient Egypt, of ancient Kemet. The Ethiopian. I said the Ethiopian, the Kui, Kui land, the Kush. Hebraically, the Kush in ancient, um, the Metunet in ancient Egypt, one of the references to the Tob, right? What we know as Tobia, or we get the term through the Greek of Ethiopia, but the original Tob, the good land, the Aden, Aden. People talk about the Garden of Eden, but really, where was Eden? Because the Garden was eastward in Eden. If I tell you the store is in the mall, the first thing I have to find is not the store, but first find the mall. So if you're looking for the garden, right, of Eden or eastward in the Aden, Aden, which means the lights and pleasures, right? The lights and pleasurable tobe, like the tobe we get Tobia and Ethiopia from originally. So the continent that's now called Africa, scripturally, biblically, is the Aden. Right, the primary part of the Aden, right? The Aden, the Aden, Eden. And what's interesting is that there's the Gulf, right? It's right over here in the horn. You see where the horn was Kush is? That horn where Arabia, right? Where Arabia and the Horn of Africa just meet. You see that close, close space right there down the Red Sea? See right here, the Red Sea and that close place right there where Shem and Arabia meets up. Right with the Horn of Africa, that tight space, we can't zoom in on it anymore. It's actually called the Aden, Aden. Some say Aden, Aden, Aden. Right, right there. So even that right there is a is a powerful tell, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers. But here, we're looking at the origin. Right, what is the origin of ancient? What's called ancient Egypt or Hebraically, the Mitzrayim, 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 later Hebrew, the Hikapata, Hikapata, Hikapta, Egypt, Hikapata, Gipta, Gipta, Gibbets, right? But many ones and ones refer to as Kemet, right, today, right? But the origin, the origin of ancient Kemet is ancient Ethiopia, inner Ethiopia, a.k.a. inner Africa, right, inner Africa. Really love this map right here because it gives a good, you know, good working context, right? Although the continent was known as Tob. The continent before was renamed. See, this continent was renamed Africa. So a lot of us use the term and a lot of scholars and would-be scholars and ones who are talking about it, even the black conscious community use this term Africa as pseudonymous. We talk about the Belgium Conference Rather, yeah, the Belgium Conference where they divided up Africa, the scramble for Africa. Well, this is when the name, when they renamed, right? We're talking about the times of the Gentiles, the times of the nations, the European nation, when they renamed the continent. And we show this many times. This is not the place to go into that. But looking at the old maps, the ancient maps, in fact, the so-called transatlantic slave trade is, is pseudo. That's pseudo. Just to show how strong it is, how easy it is for them to throw something out there, and how even our scholars will repeat verbatim what they throw out there and argue a lot of different points, but yet the very point of the argument in true context is pointless. So really the continent is Ethiopia, right? And yes, Ethiopia, a latter day, it's a transliteration, so to speak, a Greek transliteration of the original Tob. Now Tob. Tob means good. Tob. Hey Toba. Hey Tob. Hey Toba. Hey Tobia. Ethiopia. The Tob land. So let's get to the origin right here. Well, the first fact of the matter, and we know that this is in some scrolls that we have, is that the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Chemites, right? One may say the Chemites. Here we have right here. Notice where it says Garden Eastwood, right, in Eden. Hmm. You see, now there's a dispute whether the garden, right, eastward in Eden, right, was on the, we could say the Egyptian side, right, or whether it was, whether it was on the side of the river of Egypt or whether the river Euphrates. There's this debate. We're going to pick up on, well, where was, based on the evidence. Scripture provides some very interesting links. It even names, you know, certain lands, Right, to be like the Garden of Eden, even in the Avraham, the Avraham Ha'ibri, 
Ha'ebri, right, narrative with Abraham and Lot and Lot, where they, the shepherds, the herdsmen had disputed, and there's like a separation, and Abram said to Lot, like, you choose, you know, for your and your, your, your herdsmen, your flock, so that our 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 herdsmen are not disputing over grazing grazing rights and then it was said that well when he looked over to Sodom and Amora Amora actually it's Amora 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 so it's a deep sound of ain that in transliteration they call it Gomorrah but it's Amora Sodom and Gomorrah when he looked over there in the plains right it said it was well watered like the Gan Ba'aden, like the garden Ba'aden, like the garden in Eden. And it says that the garden was eastward in Eden. Now, these maps that we have today are not quite, right, the locations, not all the locations are quite in the same alignment. You know, there's Teutonic plates, there's land mass moving. Some of you might have heard about Pangaea where the continents right, were connected, and we can even see that when we study some of the maps at the likely connection of continents, right? So what Moshe, you know, describes, right? Moshe, right, and the Levitical, we could say, scribes describe in the first book, Bereshith is based on many ancient fragments, right, that Moshe, right, being the head of the fraternal order of the Lewim, Halloween, the Lewawian, right, commissioned or had written. So, yes, we do ascribe Moshe as the primary, you say, author, the head of that fraternal order, right, that collected and supervised, right, and inputted the basic context of the translation, the basic, we say, the majority of what we have, the core of it. So, we have, like, fragments, right, and books. Some might call it books or scrolls or... Um, what's the word, sapa, safir, right, um, to tell, recounting, right, recounting of the time of Adam, right, scrolls of Adam, there were scrolls of patriarchs, we also know of Hanok and Enoch. Now today we have latter um, writings, right, later writings, right, or even re when we say rewriting, so this doesn't get twisted right here in rewritings, you have to recognize that in ancient Egypt, we can find a lot of ancient scrolls because of the nature of the land, the dryness, the preservation of certain artifacts. In certain other regions, these documents, manuscripts, and scrolls, we know the tradition, the recording, the history, especially in the highland. The highland, right, is known as Tob, right, or the Tobia, the Kui land. The Egyptians called the Kui land. And it's now when we go, remember the Nile goes from south to north. You see where we have garden, eastward in Eden. We scroll down to Mizraim, Mizraim. You see where we have Kush, right? And see, if we follow it continually, you see right here next to the word world, right? That, that area there, that's actually a river, right? And we can see even parts of the river there as we go all the way to the south, right? So this is what we mean by either we'll refer to as inner Africa or the inner tobe, right? The inner tobe for, for good, right? The word tobe means good, the good land. Or in the scriptural sense, the Aden, the Aden, right? The Eden, the land of delight, the land of pleasure, the land of good, the good land, Africa. And we know that Africa is a good land even for all those resources, right? Those, those natural resources there, right? So the, what we call Africa today, but now when we look at the origin of ancient Kemet, right? So we start out with the map first, just to put things in context, right, to the map, right? Now remember that Shem, Ham, and Yafet were all brothers, right? And therefore, it is ludicrous to think that Noah, or Noah, their father, right, spoke three different languages. Do you think that Noah, now I know some folks will talk about whether these were real or not real. See. It is easy to mythologicalize real people. You see what I'm saying? To mythologicalize real people, right? Then we could say vice versa, right? A myth becoming real, right? So ones will say that these things are myths, right? And there is the myth, but they don't understand the definition of myth. How ancient peoples, even the ancient Egyptians, you know, we see things where they have somebody with a a, a bird head. Do we really think that person was a bird head? Right? We see somebody with a dog head. 
Do we really think they had a dog head or snake head, a serpent head? Now, some would even maintain that perhaps there were these sort of mutations. Right now, ones will say, well, have you found any bones? Well, we're not really grave diggers. It's other nations of people that have turned to grave digging, right, in these kind of foolish arguments, right, about ancient history, right, and ancient even mythology or spirituality that the ancient peoples who were no fools, since we got everything we got today based on that kind of evolution, as it were, right, of ideas and thoughts and culture, so forth and so on. But let's get to the root right here, right? The root or the origin, let's bring this out right here so we can bring up the next meme. The origin, the origin, right? The origin, let's start out right here with, okay, we'll start out right here with, Let's go to I and I, a brother who has done such great, extraordinary research. And there's many scholars that know of his work, but they don't have the tools, right? The tools. And the tools is the linguistics, is the language. And this is the shame of a lot of our black scholars, you know, or even ones in the Kemetic and other areas, that they have not really investigated the Tob, right, or Tobia, or Ethiopia in connection with what the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians said that the, their origin, they even point to the origin of their gods, like the Ra, you know, they say Ra or Re, you know, from the region, right, of Tob, of the Kui land, the Kushite land. We know that it was a godsend, the inundation of the Nile, where the topsoil from Tobia, from Ethiopia, from inner Africa, inner Ethiopia, right? the region of Kenya, Uganda, Wakanda, Tanzania, and even deeper south, where they got the, 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 the Kemet from. In fact, the Kemet, Kemet came literally from Tob, Tobia, the Kui land, also known in the Hebrew Bible as the Kush. Literally, the Kemet. Because what is Kemet? What is Kemet? Kemet refers to the land, the ground, the agricultural ground. In the Hebrew, we'll refer to that as the Adama, the Adama, the Adama, which is really the mother of Adam. Adam's mother is the Adama. And the people talk about Mother Earth, right? Well, the Adama, as you know, Adam, right? Adam, Aleph, first, Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, also as a pictograph, the ox head. Right, but first, right, first or a chief is also known as an Aleph, right? Aleph Dam, first blood, right, or the chief Dam. Dam is blood. And so we know that the Adama refers to the reddish brown ground, that rich reddish brown ground. We can get into a kind of a show and tell. I think we have some stills on that, but the reddish brown ground. So the inundation, the floods, the floods that Every year, with the rise of the dog star Cyrus, right, it is said that when the dog star Cyrus rose, right, the Kemetiu, the Kemetic, the ancient Egyptians right, would expect right, that inundation or the, the flood of the waters, the waters right, would come down, right, come down the now. Right, when we say down, also we are literally saying down. Egypt is a depression, a depression, it's a low land. My, in fact, even below the hoary zone. This is why they had to build it up. This is why they built pyramids, right? What's called pyramids, the mirrors. They had to build these migdal, right? The migdalim, the pyramid, right? To remind them of home. Egypt, right? Ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet was a colony of the gods. The gods, according to the ancient Egyptians and the most ancient of what has been found to be their writings and the telling of their, their mythos, their narrative, their story, their history, their mythology, one can say their religious, the earliest ideas point to their origins and the origin of the natures, netur, neteru, netert, you know, being the Kush land, the Ethiopia land, in the Africa land, and they specifically said that the origin, the gods, or the Netaru, they dwelt on this high land, this high land, this high land that we even know the connection of ancient Tob and Tobia, we should, you should be familiar, 
right? That some say that the primordial, the earliest, earliest form of Zeus and the so-called Greek gods, right? There's two narratives out there. One is that the so-called Greek gods, now you know the original Greeks were not white folks. The original people in that region that's known today as Greek, as Greece, were not white folks. They were Ionians. They were known in ancient Egypt as the Keftiu. They are pictured on the wall paintings and the wall monuments. I say that to some of, you know, my fellow Hebrew Israelites and others who do look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of ancient Egypt. So we look at that there's some things of ancient Egypt, not like some of the overzealous Hebrews and Israelites, you know, that from a half original biblical hermeneutic, we say half original, right? It's like um, they're, they're thinking local but their body is foreign, you know what I mean? In other words, they may be black and recognize that Israel is black, right? And maybe they look at Yeshua and the prophets and the apostles and the tribes as being black, so they're conscious by blood, by blood, right? right? But their mind is, is not spiritually, they don't have that spiritual blood, they still are thinking, right, in the white man's mind. This is what we mean by half original, half original. If we look at the information right and the facts for ourselves we'll see that the kush or the kui land was not only at the root and the origin of the kemetic or the ancient egyptian culture though on the west side the west side ancient culture but also the east side ancient culture and even though east side ancient culture that's not looking at mesopotamia or hebraically we refer to it as the aram naharaim Right, the Aram of the two rivers, right, the two rivers. Now we have those two rivers over there, and then we have the river, right, of Egypt, which more correctly, since the river, the part that's in Egypt of the river is the latter part of it, the origin of it. Where does the origin of the Nile come from? Where does the Kemet, that rich, reddish brown, agricultural, nutrient rich ground, Iron, I think they say iron, the ground having a lot of iron makes it red. You know, I've been doing some research and study on that. What makes the soil red? What is the red, the rich red soil good for? Well, this is the soil they were looking for, but it was not even just like red soil that came in. It was so red, it was so rich because it came from Tobia, from Ethiopia, from inner Tobia, from inner what's called Africa, the inner part of the continent at the source or the sources of the headwaters as they flow through the highlands, the rooftop. You know that Ethiopia is referred to as the rooftop of Africa because of its elevation and, it, and the mountains, as the mountains round about the highland, right? So we get some of the primary geographical, eschatological, like, like spiritual, like, like taking the geography in connection with the mythos, the spiritual narrative right concerning the mountains the natural formation of mountains and when i say like the mountains round about jerusalem we know the song this is where the original typology for it many ones have even said that the yah some say that the yah worship right actually also comes out of tobia this will point to even the the ethiopian origin right of the primary we call it the hebraic narrative the primary hebraic narrative but even before the Hebraic narrative became manifest through Abram Ha'ibri, we have the Ur of the Chaldees, we have Sumer, we have Babal, Akal, Kalna, Erek, over in the Far East with the Iran, Iraq region today, that particular region, and Nineveh, you know, today, right? So, just to point that out right there, just want to point to the origin, but here we're just going to zoom in once again. Where did the Kemet come from? Where did the Kemet come from? The Kemet is that reddish brown ground that after the inundation, right, would be sorted, so to speak, and this is where the Egyptians would acquire their food, right? Or where the colonists, let's call them what they were. They were colonists. The earliest narratives of ancient Egypt, and we're gonna get into some of some more of the exhibits, but right here is like the overview, right? The first of all was stating that ancient Egypt had Ethiopian origins and then as a kind of a footer right a footer a commentary footer why aren't more of the black conscious scholars 
not just pointing it out, but getting into some real research. There are even some Europeans, right, or some white people, non-black conscious scholars and black scholars who have gone into some research. What's interesting about a lot of those who have gone into research and have proven that the origins, not just of the ancient Egyptian, but we can say the ancient um, Semitic, as one of them may say, the Semitic, <laughs> because remember, Gutas, Ethiopic, the ancient Ethiopic language Gutas is Semitic. We have a group of people called the Tigra, right? the Tigra speaking Tigrinya, as we have here in my brother Legacy Alen's book right here, Amarinya, right? Amarinya, also known as Amharic. Amharic is linguistically, according to the scholars and the academics, labeled as, and the, and the, um, um, yeah, the linguists labeled as Afro-Semitic. The Afro, another way to say it is Hamo or Kamo or Kemo-Semitic. This is how they refer, you know, to the linguistic. Hebrew is also Afro-Semitic. Tigrinya is not Afro-Semitic, but it's Shemitic. I find it to be curious that there's a river Tigris, the Tigris, they say the Tigris, 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 Euphrates, Tigrinya. But we know that the peoples, right, the, the original peoples of whom the Martin peoples are descendant from of many generations, especially those Tigrinya, right, and we say the Ethiopic or those Shemitic people. We have a Cushitic and Shemitic people inhabiting this Horn of Africa region for thousands of years, for thousands of years. So this turns upside down the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, right, racist, racism, apartheid, table of nations philosophy. The way that the table of nations has been interpreted that that one is one is white, one is black and one is gray or one is a so-called Negroid, one is a Caucasoid and one is a Mongoloid. Because it seems like a lot of religious folks, Bible folks, even ones who believe some true things still believe that lie. And it's stumbling, right, the progress. But here is Brother Legacy Allen's his translation right here or retranslation of the Book of the Dead, the Part Im Haru, also known as the Papyrus of Ani. But the translation of this right here is based on the root language and the root linguistic. See, there's ones who say they have translated some ancient Egyptian documentation, so forth and so on, and many of the black scholars and the pro-Kemetic, Kemetic scientists, the rest of them, they have been led to believe these things, but they have not gone to the key. And this is interesting. This is highly interesting, right? Because you would think, right, that if they hold to ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, and if the Nile flows from south to north, that means and the, and the, and the inundation brings that rich reddish brown topsoil for which they rename the land. Many ones who refer to Egypt, they won't say Egypt, they'll say Kemet. Right? And if they know what Kemet refers to, it refers to the land, the ground, right? And the dark, rich, reddish, brown, blackness of the ground. In other words, they'll say it's black, but really it's so dark, rich, reddish, brown because of those nutrients. So in other words, every year, topsoil right, would flow down from the highlands and inner Africa, right, inner Ethiopia, Right, would flow down in order for the people of ancient Egypt to survive and eat. Because what can you grow in desert? It's a desert, lowland, depression. It's a desert because in its origination, right, some say right, they were colonists. Now we know that they were sent or they left. Right? Either they were sent there some even look at it as a prison originally originated as a prison colony. Some say, right, that it originated as a prison colony. But we do have later day testimony. I want to say later day, like after, you know, after it happened, right, from ancient Egypt as well as ancient Ethiopia, confirming and affirming that Egypt or Mizraim, Mizraim was a colony was a colony of ancient Kush, ancient Tobia, 
and where did they get the Kemet from? See, that, that's a point we got to have to ride up on that. Where did they get the Kemet from? All right? In other words, what is the Kemet? They say, oh, Kemet is the name of ancient Egypt. That's the ground because it's, it's black and we black people and they're black people and the ground was black. But you see where they're going over and what they're leaving out, in other words? They're going over the part that they want to hold to but not where the Kemet come from. The Kemet comes from the same very place right, that the roots of the culture, you know, the concepts, right, and the original patterns. In fact, no one has really asked the question, why would they build a pyramid? Look around ancient Egypt. Look around. Are there any pyramids? Are there any mountains? So people coming from a place that had mountains, right, mountains, would no doubt create mountains, right, just as people do. When people like Americans and white people come from Europe, they came to America, they renamed a lot of places, Boston, New Hampshire, this and that, Brooklyn, all these were named, Birmingham, you know, they, all these were names, right, from where they came from. So we know that this is part of just basic human psychology. Some would just rename names. Right? Some would even create buildings. We know that the white people did this over here in America, especially on the southern plantation. Right? Even though these people were like, like, like you say, like, like white trash, so to speak. Right? Once they got their hands right, on the Beta Israel in slavery and in servitude and everything, they started to get rich and they started to build these houses like the people they looked up to when they were back in Europe. You know, because many ones had left, you know, um, Europe to come to America for better opportunities, right? And coming to this rich country and everything else, including the enslavement of the Beta Israel, right, over here in the West, caused them to get rich, right? And what they do with those riches, they emulated or simulated, right, the culture that they looked up to where they were. Right back in England, you know, and in spiritual terms, England is like Upper Egypt and America is like Lower Egypt or Babylon and the daughter of Babylon, respectfully. But what they did was they duplicated the life that they saw others had that showed that they, they made it. You know, it's like what people do today. Like when people are poor and they're looking in magazines and watching TV and the celebrities, and what they come into money or into some wealth or position, they will seek to do what? The same thing, right? So this is what the colonists, right, that originated, right, from Kush or from Tobia, right, who went down the Nile. Now, the question is, how did they get down the Nile, right? Were they a colony, right? Did it begin off as a prison colony? Right? And then develop into something else. We know that people say, oh, that's crazy. Well, isn't it crazy, Australia? Think about Australia for a moment. Isn't Australia crazy as well? Right? Now, we're not disputing whether the people were black. We would dispute whether they were African. <laughs> Since Africa is a terminology imposed by the Europeans when they divided up the continent into so many artificial nation states. We will dispute that since even on their maps and maps that preceded their evil doing, their evil deed of divide and conquer, even said Tobia, right? And we'll show you why, why they ran from the name Ethiopia. The white man, he had to change that name, right? Because when we start to then look at what part of the world Rome was able, how far Rome was able to go down the Nile, they were not able to get past Kush and get into the real highlands and the inner Africa, and that's because right, of the originators. In fact, in ancient Egypt, it is said, you know, you hear they talk about Nubian pharaohs, and you know about Taharqa. Taharqa is there in the scripture. In the Bible, it calls him king of the Ethiopians. You study in ancient Egypt, well, you know that he basically came from the upper Egypt. Whenever lower Egypt got got into, into kind of like, like when England, it's like England and America, you know, Back in World War II, you know, when England was doing bad, right, in a sense, their children helped out America. But in ancient, ancient Ethiopia and ancient Egypt, it was the opposite way around. Whenever the children, so to speak, messed up, 
right, the parent or the older culture. That's why even when you look at some of the Nubian and Kushite pharaohs and some of their artwork, some of the racist white historians will say, oh, these are the Kushite because they want people to believe that the ancient Egyptians were white or were not black or, quote, not African. So they'll say that, oh, it was these Kushites right, or Nubians who were emulating. They were so infatuated with e Egyptian culture that they were emulating it. And you know what? They actually did ancient Egyptian culture better than the ancient Egyptians, but they would come in whenever ancient Egypt had problems, it's almost like to reboot it, they would send more ones and ones down the Nile, right? From where the Kemet, the earth, remember food, food security. If it wasn't for Ethiopia, they would not have the concepts and the patterns, right, of their mythos, their mythology, right? They would not have food, right, if it wasn't for Tob and the inundation of the Nile. So, therefore, when we say that Ethiopian, the Ethiopian origins of ancient Egypt, of ancient Kemet, is also to provoke the black scholars, you know, to um, get off of the so-called white academic titty, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> so you talk about Mother Africa, like Mother Ethiopia, you know, Ethiopia was mother, in that sense, and father to a degree, right? Mother, right, to ancient Egypt, right? But check this out right here, Amarinya and Tigrinya Kaal, the papyrus, papyrus of Ani, the retranslation, right? Some very good books out there because our culture has not faded over time. It's still the same. This one right here pointing out Ethiopian talking about, there's a video, I forget the name of it right now, but it's speaking to this very same point about ancient Egyptian culture, right? And if one seek to really decipher, understand it, one has to look at Ethiopia, Tobia, and the many different... See, Ethiopia is not a monolith. Ethiopia is not a monolith. Ethiopia is not a monolith. That means it's not just one piece of stone. It's almost, in a sense, like a pyramid, in a sense. What is pyramid? Pyramid has a lot of different stone that is brought together and, and fit and, and fit it together. So you have many different ancient cultures. In a sense, in Ethiopia, both today's Ethiopia, but also extending to ancient and past Ethiopia, you have like a microcosm in the Tob, Tobia, Ethiopia, right? As you have in the continent of Africa and the roots for the world, right? The people around the world. But you have within Ethiopia, a microcosm of the macrocosm. So that means like when you look at the different tribes, the different peoples, the different physiognomies, so forth and so on, the different complexions, the different so-called colors and kinds of we black people, right? In Ethiopia, you begin to see the match work. You can match them to other peoples who are, you know, spread across the continent today and even peoples extending even to Asia, right, to the Hindus Kush, beyond the Hindus Kush, right, even to China, you know, and Indonesia, even to Japan, even to Australia, right? So the same thing that was done in Australia. Think about what ha happened in Australia. In Australia, England had let loose primarily, they said, a lot of their prisoners. Other people came along later on, but the first bunch, the first set, was a bunch of prisoners, convicts, who they would give their freedom for them to, you know, try to do better and cut a life for them elsewhere, but they had to get off of the island. They had to get out of Great Britannia, and they sent them to, and we know historically what happened down there with indigenous people, and then eventually look at Australia today, right? So that kind of shows us these patterns of human movement and development that ain't nothing new under the sun. This book is also a very good book right here, perfect for travelers to Egypt, right? And students of ancient Gibbets. Gibbets, Gibbets, Gibbets is like another way of saying the Hekapita, 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 Egypta, Egypta. Hekapita became Hekapita, Hekapita, and Gipta. And this is where we get Gibbets. And this is where they also bring out in the English Egypt. But I was speaking of one kind of city state, right? Within, you know, there were, there were many different city states in ancient Egypt, 
where sometimes they ruled from this area, from Upper Egypt, sometime near the Midway, and sometime from Lower Egypt. But anyway, brothers and sisters, just getting to the roots right here, right, of ancient the Egyptian, what are the Egyptian origins, right, to put things into, yes, it's some of the brothers' works right here, to put some things into perspective. This is some of the other books right here, The Woman. Check out this book as well by Legacy Alain, the woman who invented writing and ancient Egyptian civilization. The missing link in technology, woman's history, and girls' education. Also, since the brothers subtitled it The Missing Link, there's a book going back to the early um, 20th century, the early 1900s, by Reverend Sterling M. Means. And it's called, wait for it, Ethiopia, the missing link, right, in African history, right, the missing link in African history. And we are positing and putting forward here on the beam of that Ethiopia is at the origin of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, and Ethiopia, the Kui, the Kush, is at the origin, right, of ancient, ancient, far, we would say, Eastern culture. Right, that they call like in Babylon, especially Babylon. If I told you, what, what would you say if I said to you that Kush, Ethiopia, started Babylon? <laughs> first shall be last, the last shall be first. So both the root of the two primary cultures that most of the academics dispute. Most of the academics today, they dispute whether civilization came from Mesopotamia and Sumer, right, over in the Iraq, you know, the Iraq kind of area, you know, of the world, Iraq, uh, Nineveh, Kurdistan area, you know, that particular region of the world, or whether it came from the Nile Valley. But really, they missed the point. You know, think about birth for a moment. Birth has a lot to do with water, the, the breaking of water, the bursting forth of water. Even with the inundation of the Nile, the ancient um, Kemetiu, Kemetans, the Kemites, Mitzrayim, they looked at the inundation to be connected with an ongoing cyclic process of birth, right? Almost like rebirth, right? That rebirth, because when the inundation came about, right, this told them that they would have the possibility of having food, agriculture. Because the Kemet flowed down. It's like Mother Tob, Tobia, Ethiopia gave that Kemet, right? Gave that reddish, black, brown, reddish, brown ground that they needed, right? To sustain, right? To sustain their living. And this is one of the reasons why with the GERD, the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam, and some of the politics going on today regarding Ethiopia and Egypt, why Egypt was so... One of the reasons, right, you know, why they were so turned up about it, you know, with Ethiopia and the other, we say the the the, the now the now states or the um, there's there's another name for those those countries like Kenya, Tanzania, right, Wakanda or Uganda, you know what I mean, along the east that share those waters. Remember those waters, right, that we have in ancient Egypt. There will be no water in ancient Egypt if the water did not flow right from Tobia. So we see a lot of points of origin. This is why we talk about where does the Kemet come from. A lot of points of origin, right? Both in things that are natural, right? And also in the people, where the people came from, where their gods came from, the ancient Egyptian gods, they point to their origin. So, therefore, since we have Ethiopia today with all the different peoples, right? The Hamitic, the Ham, the Kemitic peoples, right? Like say the Oromos, right? And also the Shemitic people like the Tigra, Tigris, Euphrates, the Tigra people. And also the Afro-Shemitic people, the Hamo-Shemitic people, the people that are a blend of those people, right? Like the Amhara and so many other peoples, right, with some dialects and linguistics that this brother right here really shows, go to show, that you really can trace, 
you can get a true interpretation of ancient Egypt. Ancient Egyptian, Ethiopian culture of ancient Egypt. Got to get this book right here. So this is, this is where we present our proofs. My, many of our points of reference, our proofs right here to the works that our brother Legacy Alain did and has done, right? I think 23 books so far. Introduction to Amarinya and Tigrinya, the dual hieroglyphic language, deciphering the language, right? Ancient Egypt, right? The Ethiopian culture of ancient Egypt. This book right here, detailing hairstyle, fashion, food, recipes, and funerals. So what he's doing is looking at the ancient Egyptian monuments and the artifacts and the evidence, right? Taking the words, the glyphs, right? Showing you what other scholars that deny and ignore the real roots of ancient Egypt, what they tell you the translation or the metuneta means, and then showing you the culture, even as it still exists among peoples, right, that descend from these ancient cultures right here. So truly, ancient Egypt is like a mouthpiece of ancient Tobia, ancient Ethiopia, right? And we can say like the ancient Africa, so to speak. The Ethiopian culture of ancient Egypt, here we have food, markets, temples, and social culture, right? So this is what's interesting. Many times they will say, well, this word in ancient Egypt, they'll try to connect it with maybe some Arabic or some other kind of thing going on today and everything. And there might be a few points of correspondence. Here, we get all points, all points. And then to have this culture, right, still living, the, the roots of ancient Egyptian culture is still alive and well today. So here, 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 just to promote the works of I and I brother right here, and the research is, is vital research because it seems like even black consciousness has been stuck, right, has been stuck because they've just been relying on the conventional translations already provided, right? And most of the ones who are doing, you know, any translation, even if they can speak other languages, it's usually other European languages. Maybe they can speak French. Maybe they can speak German or Spanish or something like that. But can they speak any of the, the languages that are at the roots? Can they speak a Hamitic language? Right? That's at the roots of ancient Egypt or Shemitic language at the root of ancient Egypt. Then the brother even goes forward to even show, you know, the Amarinya Tigrinya links of the Russian language, the Amarinya Tigrinya roots and links of the Chinese language, the Amarinya Tigrinya Kal roots of the Japanese language. Yes, <laughs> Rastafari. But here, 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 just on the outro right here, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers. Let's just go through this right here as we're in the outro right here. Just some of the word picks right here, right? To see some of the links between the peoples, right? So, talking about black people over here, right? Because remember, Egypt was much like ancient Tobia or ancient and even modern Ethiopia. That there were certain peoples that were historically ruling peoples and families, Right? But even they were made and composite of other people, other, we could say, root races. Right? So there's many different, you could say, tribes. As there's 3,000 tribes in Africa, we get the roots of that in Ethiopia, even the Ethiopia that we can testify today and in ancient times. And this gives us an insight into ancient Egypt, right? into ancient Egypt. Right? It wasn't just the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Hebrews, but there were many, many, enough, enough different other people groups right? that all figured and featured on the table of nations as we have in the scripture. Just to show the comparison right here between the ancient right, and the modern peoples right here, as well as this right here, just some word picks right here. Right? And these people right here, right? The, I think the Afar people, so one of the oldest people, Afar. Now, Afar in the Hebrew and even in the Amharic, right, I think in the Tigrinya should be so as well. Afar, right, means dust, like the dust of the ground. But then we have a group of people whose genetics have been studied and said to be very ancient and old. You see the Afro, Afro, or Afaro, the Afro, they're wearing the Afaro, right, or the Afarfro, right, Afro or the Afarfro. 
we coined that right there. You, you help I and I, you know, subscribers and viewers right here, here, here. This is for you. So you can see these people here, ancient Egypt as they pictured in ancient Egypt, right? Even having the different kind of locks. You see right here, the Egyptians attention to detail, right? As John says that Egypt, my people, because in Egypt, right? From ancient days, you had all the peoples there. All the peoples made their mark, so to speak, right? Like we have in these America today, all the people. You, you can see where they got it from, right? So here we have an Ethiopian here, right? And we can see even from the ancient, you know, Kemetic, right? So if we can see the people, what about their language? Language is the key of culture. Language is the key of communication. Language is the key of culture, right? And the Ethiopic linguistics is the key of deciphering ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet, all right? right? And not just there were black people, the founders. We can go into China, into Europe, into North America, but we're starting out right here with ancient Egypt. Yes, I, Rastafari. So a couple of more right here. Right, you know, and it's interesting looking at you know some of these ancient you know artifacts, right? Because some of them look just like peoples today, right? And we can find a lot of these looks, a lot of these peoples, even in Obia, even in Ethiopia to this very day. All right, my brothers and sisters, we said we're gonna let this be short, a short vlog right here, right? But it's a picture, it's a thousand words. Right, so to add to some of the words, right, showing you a couple of these pics right here as well. Look more, yes, I like, share, and subscribe. Shalom, Rastafari. This is Ras Ayadonis Tafari, L O J S dot O R G.